Stanford University. Good afternoon. Welcome to this beautiful space and to this occasion of awakening to space and place. My name is Dr. Tia Rich and I have the joy of directing the Contemplation by Design Summit. And I'd like to just take a moment to thank Reverend Scotty McLenahan who had the ability to support the idea when it was just a conversation seven years ago. Today we have the pleasure of being guided by two wise and insightful architects to awaken to how the process of contemplation can be supported by our built environment. I'd also like to thank Green Library for allowing us to hold this session in this beautiful contemplative space, which is usually preserved just for contemplation, reading, and study. So we want to thank them for allowing us to gather here today, which is unusual. There are not very many events held here. First, I'd like to introduce John Barton, the director of the Stanford Architectural Design Program. He's also an architect in private practice and has a real eye for the role of the built environment in creating well-being. And I'm grateful to him for his attention to well-being and how he designs his academic program. So let's give him a warm round of applause and a little expression of gratitude. Next, we have the pleasure of the campus architect, Dave Lennox, who has been directing not only the restoration of some of the original Olmsted plan, but the vision for the future to carry out the values and mission of this institution. He is the campus architect and also the executive director of planning and design. Let's give a warm welcome to Dave Lennox. Thank you. Welcome. So let's just kind of go through a little agenda of what we're going to do. I'm going to take the first half and Dave's going to take the second half. I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes a good space. We're going to talk about order, scale, and composition. Dave's going to talk about contemplative spaces at Stanford using some of the same ideas as demonstration for that. And then hopefully there'll be time for question and answer. Um, for those of you who are interested in this, I recommend these two books, Chambers for Memory Palace, my students in the classroom. Um, who are here today know this book. And anything by Jane Jacobs just has a down-to-earth, basic human approach to planning and architecture. So what makes great spaces? And I'm gonna try and distill seven years of education and 35 years of practice into 25 minutes, uh, so bear with me. So one thing that we can look for when we feel comfortable in a space or uncomfortable in a space is we look for order and particularly alignment. How do things work? How are they related to each other? And using the quad as an example, you see the axes, the church on one end, Palo Alto on the other end, and then of course another axis running the other direction. It provides us a place to be in that space and it shows us where we are relative to the other pieces of the building. This idea transcends history and it transcends cultures. This is uh, Rome and the Forbidden City that have these axial relationships as you go through. When we don't find that alignment, the spaces become disordered, they become uncomfortable, and we search out a different place or a place at the edge. This uh, larger image is of the Boston City Hall Plaza, and you'll notice there aren't, aren't very many people in the middle of that space. They can't locate themselves within that space. The other thing we look for in order is the idea of approach and pause. The idea that as we make our path from one place to another, we know where we're going, but there's also a place to stop, take it in, and then move forward. Again, using the quad as an example, you come up Palm Drive, there's a place to pause and move around the axis, reconsider that view, come up to the stairs at the entrance of the forecourt, then the forecourt, 
then the arch, and we're gonna come back to this arch that frames the view of the church. In each of these locations, there's a place to stop, take stock of the, where you are, why you're there, what, where you've come from, and to locate yourself once again. And this idea shows up again across cultures, this idea of a path, this is a traditional garden in Kyoto on the left, and uh, you can see the path highlighted by the wall and then a place to pause at the entrance. It also helps set up ideas of public and private. Stoops in New York and Philadelphia and other cities, those aren't just stairs to the front door of the house, they're transitional places where people can sit, participate in the public, but still be in the private realm and to locate yourself. Another idea around order is the, is the notion of layers and pockets. Layers and pockets provide complexity and another place to be in a set of smaller spaces within a larger space. They subdivide the space, they provide you refuge from the larger space, and they provide a secondary tertiary space as you go through. And the quad is filled with them, from the little parks to the, to the way the arches frame secondary spaces. And um, they can be interior spaces. On the left is a project from my office, a little ingle nook off of a much larger room that just provides refuge from the larger space. And then this uh, beautiful window by Rafael, or I'm sorry, by uh, Luis Barragan in Mexico. When we don't have those layers and pockets, we end up with things like this. There's no place to access the building. There's no place to be next to it. There's no place to, in which to inhabit and find our own place in it. I think the final notion of order that I want to talk about is the idea of roofs. If you're in the quad, the roofs tell you what's happening. There's a tall roof at a key juncture. There's a tall roof at an entrance. There's taller roofs on where the classrooms are. There's shorter roofs where there's spaces between the classrooms. There's no roofs where the pockets are. Roofs give us uh, a sense of what's underneath, and they tell us something about what the building is, um, whether it's a barn, traditional African dwellings, or in this particular this Faye Jones Church in Arkansas, a sense of the sky as well. When roofs are either too complex or not complex enough, we're confused. We don't know what's in that building. We don't know why that roof has five dormers and five different shapes, and why is that little offset there? It makes no sense. So we're confused. And then this other little sad little building is it, is it a roof? Is it a wall? I don't know. <laughs> one more, I guess I had one more order uh, notion is markers. Markers in a space provide us a scale reference. There's a reason that we love the columns in the quad. It's because they're the same size as us. There's a reason that we like the burgers of Calais because they represent us in scale and size. These markers can be an alley of trees that provide a rhythm as you move through a space. They can provide you scale and a place to stop. Or they can be just as simple as the rustication in this Italian palazzo that provides a scale and a tactility uh, at the street level. When these are missing, you're lost. There's no place to attach yourself to that building. In scale, Ornament is a little bit like the words in a poem that allow you to gather your own view. I love the ornament in the Stanford Quad because it's evocative of a variety of things for me, which will be different for Tia and different from Dave, where the other components I've just talked about provide us a, a place for the community to understand the space. And, uh, ornament provides us an in, in, individual place to enjoy the space and to interpret the space as we go through. And decoration can be the, I've, I find the most beautiful part of the church, the, those amazing trusses in the, at the back of the church. And, scale, and ornament can be extraordinarily complex as in this mosque in Isfahan, Persia, or in this church in 17th or 18th century Austria. It can also be 
a bit humorous. This is Mies van der Rohe's Seagram's building where he attached wide flange steel beams to the building that have no role. They're decoration, that they're a little whimsical. They're sort of saying, I'm, I'm not using decoration, but I am. And he understood the power of decoration in that sense or ornament. An ornament can just be color as in this amazing Barragan horse farm in Mexico. When a building lacks ornament of any kind, again, we have no way to individually approach the building. This is perhaps the saddest building I've ever seen. <laughs> way worse than the other one. And there, the idea of composition is the notion of proportion. Uh, proportion is something that we feel intrinsically in a space. Does it match? Our, is it the right height? Is it the right width? Are the right widths and the right heights related to each other? I think the quad has extraordinary proportions, um, and you feel at home, in, particularly in the, uh, the arcades. Composition, again, transcends cultures. In Japan, there's the ken. In the Western tradition, there's the golden ratio. And you can see how the Greeks really understood that ratio, and then how the modernists, despite their stated break with the past, were using ratios and proportions to honor those spaces. When it's missing, we just see it. It just doesn't feel right. It feels uncomfortable. Light, shade, and shadow. So light is the idea of being in the sun, in the direct sunlight. Shade is where we see the passing of time across the courtyard floor or the arcade floor. And sh shadow is the absence of light. Those are three very different things. And you can move through them and you can find yourself located in a very short order in three different kinds of locations. You can be in the warmth of the sun. You can be in the shade and shadow, what, literally watching the day pass by on the floor. Or you can be in the dark, darker parts of the space. That range of spaces allowed, again, gives, gives us choice and an opportunity to be in different places. And they physically feel differently on our body. We've been fascinated for centuries by the, how the sun passes through the day. On the left is uh, the Pantheon in Rome, one of the first concrete domes. Um, we don't know exactly what its goal was, but it traces the arc of the sun um, through that oculus. And then this beautiful concrete work by Tadao Ando in Japan showing how the sun moves through the day. Shade and shadow have cultural and regional components. In Copenhagen, where the light is at a premium, they're going to harvest it. They're not going to have overhangs. They're going to have as big windows as they possibly can. In the Sonoran Desert, you're going to be protected from the, that sun where you can be. And if we have too much sun, as in this white house, or not enough sun, we we feel that as well. This house is a famous modernist house that was rendered essentially inhabitable because it heats up uh, so badly. And this museum has next to no light whatsoever. The reality is that these things don't work just by themselves. They work in, as they layer up and they build upon each other. And I'm going to use th this space in the quad and this room as examples of that. So this is one of my favorite spaces. This is the main arch that's between the forecourt and the main quad. And if you go to that space, you'll see that the roof raises up. It's a bigger arch. It's on axis. The floor steps up to it. There's a place to stand. There's a place to be in the shade. There's a place to be in shadow. There's a place to be in the sun. All of those spaces, for me, all of those ideas for me layer on top of each other and provided me to be one of the most popular places for me to go visit and hang out and be. And each of you will find different places in that. But as you look for spaces that appeal to you, it's the layering. And when you find a space, the next time you're there and it feels right to you, look for the proportion, look for the sunlight, look for the scale, look for the ornament, look for the order of the space. This room that we're in, um, this is actually a slightly different room, um, but the room that we're in has much of the same thing. It has an order. It has beautiful proportions. 
These columns, despite the fact that they break up the room, provide us with those pockets. There's three pockets on that side. There's a place at these windows. The depth of these windows and the scale of these columns out here provide me a place that's about the size of my body that allows me to focus uh, on the room. The height of the bookshelves is only a little bit taller than me. It provides a datum that lowers and allows me to enjoy the height without being overwhelmed by the height. I'm going to turn it over to Dave, who's going to talk about these concepts more directly across the campus. Okay. So John talked about the, the attributes, uh, which I think almost universally make us feel good or bad about certain spaces or places. And I think even with different cultures, um, you interpret them different ways, uh, specific, specifically ornament. But I think um, what I want to do today is, is focus a little bit more on campus and talk about spaces and places that offer opportunities to be contemplative um, and, and why. So, you know, Memorial Church really ticks off almost all the boxes uh, that John talked about. Uh, the, the, the proportion is incredible. Um, the, the sense of light, shade, and shadow, it changes all day long. And you can go in there in the early morning and it's coming through one set of stained glass windows and you can be there uh, at five o'clock at night, it's coming through another set. I think also the, the idea of, of ornament isn't just about the beauty, uh, it's really about telling stories. And I, when I go in there just to sit, um, I look around and I'm always learning something new about that space. I think that's what makes a really wonderful a place to, to focus in on. And I do remember the story of Jane Stanford supposedly poking her umbrella into the carvings and, and batting the, the head of the workmen, saying they're not deep enough, make them more beautiful. And I, I think that's really a special part of this space. The stories in the stained glass windows are really something that you can focus on as well. Uh, the overlay is music, and you don't get that in all the contemplative spaces on uh, Stanford's campus, but if you ever walk in at lunch and then, uh, they're practicing on the organ, this all just comes together, and it's really a, a wonderful experience. Now, if you contrast that with the Papua New Guinea garden, um, that has equal provenance for me. I mean, it's, it's somewhat enclosed. It serves as a place apart on campus. Uh, it is a unique place. It's very convenient, but it's a unique place to stop and ponder and think. And again, the stories that are told about how these sculptures uh, came to be uh, and what they're really trying to say to you is really what makes this a magical place. We have other types of contemplative spaces that are actually designed for that purpose, whether it's a contemplative garden that was just completed it's in the vicinity of, of the lake houses or the Whispering Circle. And you know, it's interesting, our, our department, it was probably about five or six years ago, did a survey of students and said, hey, what are your favorite places on campus? We were trying to get a feel for, you know, do you love the really active uh, features of White Plaza or is it the main quad or is it, you know, your dorm? And almost universally, it was these places that students could get away. Um, get away from the stress of, of what they were doing in class or in their research. And whether in this case um, it was the, the sound of the bubbling water or even the design of the water and the stone and the ripple effect, talking about origins, or just the beautiful materiality of it, it's really a wonderful place. Um, and it's scaled in a more intimate manner to get away by yourself. But then getting back to nature, I mean, how many campuses are you able to go up to the dish and take this long path by yourself? You know, people contemplate and meditate in different ways. They recharge their batteries in different ways. And for some, just taking that walk in the morning and seeing the sunrise uh, is, is enough. Uh, whether it's a walk around Lagunita, uh, walk through the Arboretum, or even going into Dorman Grove, which is much closer to the heart of campus, I think the idea that they're beautiful, that they're sequestered uh, from your daily life, um, and again, the themes of light, shade, and shadow come into play. 
I think it's interesting to compare the Cactus Garden with Memorial Church. They're both a place apart. Uh, they both are scaled for, for sort of wonder and awe. They're unique um, in themselves. But you can also think of the idea of ornament, quote unquote ornament. And when you talk about the different species of cacti, their color, their shapes, um, the wonderful patterns that they make, it's really incredible to go there and think you're, you can always picture yourself in the church looking at all the ornament. And this is ornament of nature. It's a wonderful place, one of the most highly rated places um, in our survey. There's also some um, architectural places that have been created in the recent past. This is uh, the upper level courtyard at the Newcomb Building um, in the law school. And this was really ultimately supposed to be about bringing together faculty and students to the law school. What I think really happened is we created this incredibly beautiful space that everybody is, is welcome to go to. And you can see in the upper left, from an architectural standpoint, this was when it was first constructed. The right two pictures really show the verdure that's happened, the way that nature has overtaken it, and it really becomes a wonderful place, again, to go with a colleague, to go by yourself, to read the paper in the morning, um, just to get away, and it's right there in campus. Art is a, is a great opportunity on campus also to refresh yourself. So here is the uh, Stone River by Andy Goldsworthy right outside the Canner Arts Center. And it's A, set in a natural setting. Um, it again has proportion, it has pockets and layers as John talked about. It has wonderful scale built from stone that um, is part of Stanford. But it also is a little mysterious and a little bit about discovery and imagination. And it's, again, a great place to go, see it in different lights of day. Um, there's even been uh, you know, performances out here for dance and drama. The galleries, you know, again, we have these wonderful resources at Stanford. Uh, sitting in front of a piece of modern art or even a piece of, of other types of art and just pondering from a bench can be very, very, very soothing. And I think we have both in the Anderson Collection and the Canner Arts Center, great opportunities for that. But I think the Richard Serra sequence sculpture that was in the courtyard of the Canner Center is just, it's a great, great opportunity. It's almost like a labyrinth in a way, if you've been through that, where you can really pace yourself, you can stop, you can take a moment, you can move through it. The scale is different. It changes as you maneuver your way through the sculpture. Again, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the light and the shade and the shadow in a very contemporary way as opposed to what you might see uh, in the main quad. The good news is that this is probably coming back in the near future. So um, for those of us that saw it take its journey away, um, we kept the concrete pad there hoping it could come back. There's a very, very likely chance it will be coming back to us. Um, and I think it is, is something that every student, faculty, and staff uh, at campus should really take advantage of, of if they can. Now, it's set within a beautiful space, and, and since we've built the Anderson Collection, there's a sense of closure, the sense of a sort of being um, in a wonderful place where you can do more than just look at art. It's, we just super laid a yoga class, right? And so there are active practices for contemplation and meditation, and I always like to look for places on campus where you can infuse and you can program them. It's not always about going to a little garden with a bubbly fountain or going out into the arboretum. Um, there are places on campus that can be very well purposed uh, for this type of activity. And as I said earlier, people recharge their batteries in different ways. Uh, and Meyer Green is not necessarily meant to be the most contemplative place on campus. But what is great about Meyer Green is you can be of yourself, oneness, but you can also be of the collective. I can sit in an Adirondack chair under a tree and kind of take a breath, but I can also see all my friends uh, doing what they're doing. And there's something refreshing about being able to do both of those things at the same time. There's fresh air, there's again light, shade, and shadow, uh, and there's a flexibility to make it your own. And you know, this was a, really designed as a temporary solution to what do we do with Meyer Library, and it's turned into, I think, a magnet 
for campus because of some of these reasons. Now, I, I'm not up here to, to say that every space at Stanford uh, is wonderful. Um, we always continue to work to improve. The upper left-hand corner is, is a discussion that came up this week. This is the court that's in front of green earth sciences right as you get on the bridge to the SEQ. And it's, it's pretty bare. It's pretty, as, as John showed you some pictures earlier of you have nowhere to anchor yourself. There is nowhere really here to anchor yourself, and we're looking for ways to improve that. Uh, the bottom right-hand photograph uh, is in Jordan Quad, again, uh, sort of a, a sad, uh, to use John's word, a sad patio um, that needs a little bit of help. Uh, and then, but even with something we've recently built, the Munger Graduate Residences, there's a courtyard that, that sort of is a little bit soulless, and it needs a little bit more help to make it something that is very useful and valued by uh, Stanford. So we continue to work on, on all of those types of things. I wanted to jump over to the Redwood City campus for a moment because this is a really important step in the university. Uh, it's a milestone. We'll have 2,500 staff members moving to this new campus uh, next year. And Tia very appropriately brought up that we really need to make sure that we offer in this campus all those same opportunities and layers of types of different spaces. So what you see here in the, in the plan is really phase one. That's what we're building in phase one. And when you really start to look at those yellow circles, there's going to be a variety of, of places people can, again, get away in some cases, like in the Stanford Commons in the bottom right, you'll be able to sit under a tree, but also maybe see activity in the, in the commons. The campus promenade, though it's not the dish, uh, will be a place where you can go out for a walk in between really rough meetings. Uh, we have a almost porch-like lounge adjacent to the dining pavilion where you can, again, take a breath, go out there and, and sort of rejuvenate. Uh, and then there's some co uh, community courtyard spaces there will also be a fitness be well uh, center where yoga and meditation uh, rooms are specifically designed to be able to accommodate that. And the actually spill out space outside of those rooms in the outdoors is also able to accommodate that as well. And then in our new way of thinking about officing, sometimes you can't even go outside quickly. You need respite and you need to recharge inside. And so our new office sort of philosophy, if you will, at Redwood City is, we're, providing less space for individuals, but more space for people to collaborate and or get away from it all um, in, in smaller areas. So we're really excited about Redwood City. This is just an aerial, uh, again, showing that as the, the vegetation grows up, um, as we learn patterns of life and how, how people are using this campus, I think we'll be able to adjust a bit on, on how to make maybe some areas a little more intimate and sequestered, other areas uh, continue to, to improve and the trees will start growing in as well. And then uh, this is our Be Well Center, uh, again, great for uh, yoga opportunities and meditation. So Jane Stanford felt strongly about a well-rounded student experience um, at campus and she advocated from day one uh, to have a diverse co-ed class. And she understand the critical balance between high academic standards, but also wellness and recreation. And as you can see in this quote, uh, the moral and the spiritual. And you know, a lot of the spaces that I showed you uh, in the last 10 minutes, we're there uh, more than 10 years ago uh, as we started to conceive of what this Wendover Contemplative Center might be. But you know, just as Jane Stanford sort of led the charge, we had strong leadership at that point that said, you know, we've hit that really critical tipping point of where we need a dedicated center for, for meditation. And so we were really excited about that. And um, you know, we, you all, with all the construction that you see on campus, probably think that we just sit in a room and think up a building, and then maybe the next day we design it, and then the next day they build it, and then it disrupts everybody on campus. Um, it's not totally true. And in fact, this building wins the award for, I think, having the longest gestation period uh, for any project that I have been a part of. 
Uh, and that was because we didn't find the right place to put it and we didn't have the sort of the right recipe. And until we got that, I think we held back and I'm glad we did. And this, this is just, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background in Windover because you've all probably been there and participated and it's a wonderful place. But how we got there is actually as interesting. And so this was a study. I, I arrived on campus in 2005 and it had already been underway. And it was sort of hitting a roadblock. Nobody could really you know, get behind it. And we looked at a variety of sites. We looked at a site adjacent to the Cantor Center. Well, we were designing Windover around a collection of art from Nathan Oliveri. That, that's all great. Uh, there was a little concern, though, that that might become too quickly associated with the Cantor Arts Center being so close and that you may end up getting a lot more tourists going through the Cantor and then going to the Windover. And so that site was, was quickly sort of um, explored and not used. Um, Frost, we thought, well, maybe next to Frost would be a good location for this. And, and at the time, the Bing Concert Hall hadn't been designed, but we always looked forward in our planning, and we sort of thought someday there might be a concert hall or a theater there. So we shied a bit away from, from putting it in that location as well. Meyer Library was still standing at that point, and we said, oh, let's put it next to Meyer Library. That would be a great place. And again, looking forward, we as planners said, we're not sure Meyer Library is actually gonna be there forever. Uh, we knew it had seismic challenges. I'd hate to design this beautiful contemplative center around a building that's going away. So that didn't work out too well. Uh, we had a really innovative idea to maybe replace that bridge I just showed you leading to that Greener Science Plaza with Windover. And so what if Windover was the bridge and the connection between the Panama Mall life and the SEQ and that you know, it ends up making that whole loading area down there much nicer because you won't see it. It'll be straddling the space. Well, of course, that lasted as long as somebody going out and observing that there's a beep, beep, beep happening every 10 minutes from <laughs> service trucks or, or trucks recycling. So that was thrown out. And then the last one was, was really an interesting concept in well, and that, as that was putting it right in the campus center. And you can look all over the world at wonderful places to get away, whether they're chapels or contemplative spaces or churches that are right in the midst of the middle of the city and you walk through the doors and you're, oh. And we thought that that could actually work, but that didn't resonate with all the people associated as well. And so we looked, we looked at the foothills, that was too far away. Where we ended up, I think, was an absolute perfect place to put this. And I think we, we sort of, we understood it needed to be close enough to the campus center so students could find it convenient, staff and faculty as well. But being adjacent to a wonderful established space already, the Papua New Guinea Garden, I think was, was really helped anchor this, this building. Um, we are still continuing to improve. And so that road that separates it from Papua New Guinea at this point, uh, we are transforming that from being a linear parking lot to a bike ped path, enhancing the landscape. So if you sit in Windover and look out the window, you're not looking at parked cars, which I think is a good thing. Uh, you know, the, the architects on this were, were absolutely fantastic to work with, and they camped here. You know, we, we interviewed them, we hired them, and then they came out and camped on the site. And why did they camp? They wanted to see student patterns. They wanted to see circulation. They wanted to understand the pattern of light, shade and shadow, uh, in the morning, evening, and afternoon. They wanted to understand smells and sounds. Um, how, how would this work? And before they even started designing, they really tried to understand the site and the setting. This was an inspiration watercolor of what this place could be. And I think for me, I could almost stop here and say this captures it all. It's got the mystery, it's got the sort of romance, it's got the, the nature, uh, but it truly was the inspiration for, for Wendover and, and how it came to be. And I just want to take you through a couple of, of, of slides that talk about things you may not realize you're doing and when you go to Wendover, but they were very intentional. And so 
Uh, the scale this building is more residential. It's meant to make you feel more comfortable. The uh, design of it is more unique. Uh, we didn't want to do a stucco building with a clay tile roof and then put Windover sign over the front door. This needed to be special. It needed to be something that would attract us. And it, we wanted to embed it in nature. You've seen in some of the other slides how important nature is for contemplation. Um, your sort of experience coming to Windover does not start inside. It should start outside. And I'm standing right now at the entrance and the moment I move around that wall is when it's intentionally supposed to begin. This whole journey from that wall to the door where you enter Windover is about decompression. So the architects very deeply knew that you can't just walk in and then all of a sudden go, ah, oh, this is great. You really need to set yourself up. So walking along the gravel, hearing the, the decomposed granite below your feet, the sound of it, seeing the layers of material, seeing the markers that John talked about, both in the light bollards as well as the trees, the rhythm of the trees, the wall and the trees eventually will make you feel very separate from what's happening just adjacent to Windover. Walking along that rammed earth wall, which is made from literally the earth of the site and rammed into forms is, is such a romantic idea, but the motion of the wall really gets you back to that front door. And this is really all intentional. It's just not something that kind of felt good or is beautiful. It's programmatically a part of it. And when you go inside, um, a lot of the same things we talked about in Memchu is the, the idea of proportion and um, ability to focus uh, the composition of the spaces, um, as well as the idea of how light, shade, and shadow affect this differently at different times of day. Again, if you go in the morning, you are not going to get the same experience as if you go at twilight. Uh, we intentionally, uh, Scotty knows us well, talked a lot about tech-free. Um, we don't want tech uh, because it's distracting. We talked a lot about this is really supposed to be about contemplation. It's not supposed to be about bus buses of tourists coming and seeing how beautiful it is. It's really intentionally supposed to be for um, that program. And so I, th I think, you know, I, we were just talking earlier, John and I, about how well it's really functioning. There are students there. Um, there are not big groups going through all the time. Um, and I think that, that that's a good testament. The exterior, the attributes, again, of a place that's quiet, a place apart, uh, is very important uh, to the success. Um, and again, layers and pockets. It's not just something we talk about and try to make up. It's literally why the exterior facing Papua New Guinea is successful. You can sit on a bench. You can move into the alcoved area and it really helps you with your solitude uh, and your introspection. And I think, uh, again, Scotty knows this well, this was really our first permanent labyrinth on campus. We had, roll, I guess we had roll out labyrinths uh, that were used around Memchu, but this is really permanent and it's only gonna get better and better as the vegetation fills in um, and it will be both a place, of, it'll be part of Windover, but it'll also be a place apart. And, and I think that's gonna be very important, but has become, again, a very important uh, component of, of our entire sort of system of spaces for contemplation, reflection. So uh, I think John, very nicely outlined why we feel good in places and spaces. Um, I tried to focus a little bit more on how that applies directly to spaces on Stanford's campus, but I, I always do want to reiterate the fact that everybody does it in their own way, you know, and, and I think our role as planners is to find a way to provide the variety um, check it with the attributes that are really important to making you feel good about where you are, but making sure we end up with beautiful spaces, beautiful landscaped areas, and places where people can just get away and process, recharge your batteries. So thank you. I think we've got some questions and answers. Does anyone have a question? Um, thank you for a very wonderful talk. I wanted to ask what makes a space soulful versus soulless? 
can you have good intentions and still make a really depressing building? <laughs> um, yes, it's very possible to have good intentions and make bad spaces. I'm going to go off on a tangent and come back to answer your question. A lot of architects like to design things that look cool rather than feel great. And if you're interested in looking cool and being graphically interesting, you're not going to have build a soulful space. Um, it takes some humility to, to work that way. It's not the way a lot of architects are trained to work. Um, it takes collaboration with the builder. It takes collaboration with the client. It takes collaboration with the users. I think of Dave's comment about the rammed earth on the contemplative center. That's a beautiful thing, but the wavy lines are taking you to the front door. It was a considered set of choices rather than just a cool thing. So that made it more, in my opinion, makes it a more soulful place. And that each element is doing double, triple duty. It's doing its job as a marker. It's doing its job as texture. It's doing its job as path um, rather than just being graphically beautiful. Um, so yes, it's possible to build beautiful things that have no soul. And, and I'll answer it with a Stanford's perspective. I, Stanford, not Stanford's, because I didn't know them well. Um, <laughs> I think Stanford as a campus has a soul. And I, I think that as, as our office deals with architects, there are times when they do design a building that is not of the soul of Stanford. It will not contribute to the value we have here. And I, I will be mean and specifically point out one, but I, I think as we were working on the art building, a couple of the early iterations were absolutely the most beautiful pieces of architecture. They were gorgeous, but they could have been for almost anywhere. And we made the comment, you know, this is sitting in a context. It's next to the Canner Center. The old chemistry is right there. Uh, Stanford has a DNA for material palettes for scale. Uh, it's got to fit in. Start to look closer at the palette, at the scale, at the connection to the landscape. And, and you know, the flippant response I got was, "Well, we don't we don't work in that palette." And I said, "Well, you do now." And. <laughs> I, I think that the building we got is one of our more sculptural expressive buildings, but it, it actually it feels like it could be part of the Stanford DNA, whereas the, the titanium and, and some of the colors that were originally selected, it looked like it could have just flown in from anywhere. And I said, you know, you were hired because we thought you could do both inspiring architecture, but architecture that had the soul of Stanford. And, and that, that when we look at contemporary buildings, when they come to Stanford as designs, it's got to do both. And good firms can do both, and you've got to push them a little bit. Thank you. I really appreciated your explanation of why the main quad works so well. You know, we often hear about Frederick Law Olmsted and design of the campus, but I, I never know, knew, could you tell us a little bit about the architect f who designed the main quad and the design process there? Did, were the, for example, were the, the Stanford's involved in, in that process, just like they were with Olmsted? I'm going to push that back to you. Push it up. I know. <laughs> Nobody pushed it up. So the Stanford's are very involved. Um, and, and to start from, from scratch, they assembled a, a stellar team. It was the best team of the era, um, H. H. Richardson's office and Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, I think Frederick Law Olmsted really took the lead with them to do the planning for the university. Uh, if, there, if you do any research on it, you'll note that he was more of a, a natural landscape guy. Right? So Berkeley and Central Park, and he did Ohio State, quite a few campuses, and he wanted to put the university campus up in the foothills with meandering paths and topography and very natural uh, settings. And the Stanfords were the ones that really said no. Uh, they had traveled a lot in Europe. They wanted monumentality. They wanted it, you know, almost like uh, Paris. There's all the axes line up. Uh, and so he reluctantly put it down on the flat plain where Governor Stanford wanted it. 
uh, but he put the, the church to the side because he still wanted the view to the foothills, and the Stanford said, no, um, we would like the church on access, uh, and so that's where the church ended up. Now, H.H. H. Richardson died um, from the day that the firm was hired, and so Charles Coolidge, which was a protege, ended up doing uh, most of the architecture. Uh, and the church, for example, was loosely um, based on the Trinity Church. But the style was sort of derivative, and you, you probably can't go around the world and see it really anywhere all put together in its complexity that John talked about. But what was great about the main quad, if you divorce it of the ornament and all of that, the beautiful things we see today, it was very sustainable from day one because they had to be. They had to use local materials. They had to have natural ventilation. They used heavy walls. They used the arcades to get away from the sun uh, for implement weather. They fed students with local food and milk from cows because they had to. They had no water. They'd use trout tolerant landscaping and they were close to the train. All the same things that today everybody thinks are all these brand new ideas to save the world were the way they actually operated 128 years ago. So the Stanford's in answer, quicker answer is they had a lot of influence on, on the planning. I think the actual style uh, came from the architect. Um, two, two how do you questions. Um, if I uh, look at the classic Stanford look that you discussed, sandstone, arches, the uh, columns and so on, my assumption is that that uh, is way too expensive for the newer construction that's going on. So how do you get the new engineering quad, uh, the new GSB, buildings like that to, to look like Stanford? You, you mentioned that. Uh, how do you think about that? And secondly, um, is uh, a question about the open space between the buildings. Um, I've always loved campus because it feels so open. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I took a friend up to the top of Hoover Tower, and I was amazed to see that just about everything within campus drive is, are roofs. It's amazingly <laughs> densely built, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't feel that way. And so how do you do that? Oh, <laughs> loaded questions. Um, I, 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 would, I would defer to John's attributes and say that the, the, the SEQ has the exact same attributes as the main quad. It has a different style um, and execution, but it has the markers. It has a light shade and shadow. Um, it has proportion. Um, it has all those things that are really important, but it, it is not the, the stylistic uh, match to uh, the main quad. And I think, A, sandstone is really hard to get right now, and it doesn't last, and we struggle and fight against erosion. Um, the, the columns of the church had to be almost totally replaced at their bases about three or four years ago. We're continually patching the cracks, and, and you get water and sandstone, it's like, it, it erodes. So we would never use that again. Um, craftsmen are really hard to find. But more importantly, it's really hard to replicate a style that was 125 years ago. We have done it, or tried to do it, in the Gates Building. And the Gates Building for computer science is, is really directly derivative. And I don't always get a lot of people that said that that was successful. Um, the gun building, I think, took some components of style and reinterpreted them in some more contemporary ways. But, it, but I think you need to look at why the main quad feels good, not just ornament-wise or stylistically, but those attributes. And you might want to Yeah, and I would say, more. stepping on Dave's territory a little bit, there was a conscious decision in the SEQ and the future quads to be not in competition with the main quad. And that is, um, makes a lot of sense from a hierarchy point of view. It places the center of campus where the center of campus is, reinforces it, um, but it also frees you up. So the SEQ is a taller set of buildings. There are three stories instead of two, and they're probably floor to floors are substantially taller. Um, there was not an attempt to copy. There was rather an attempt to say, what are the attributes that we want in a quad? What is the 
what are the main ideas that work in the main quad that we can replicate in a new way, in a new structural methods. I mean, the main quad is a stone building. It's stones laid up, and that doesn't work in modern earthquake world. So how do you handle that in a steel building? And how do you handle the stone in a way that makes it clear that it's part of the fabric of the campus, but it's not the structural element? And I think they've done a great job of that. I think also you need to be intentional about your open space. And um, we design our open space as much as we, as we design our buildings. It's part of good planning. And if you take a look at the SEQ, for example, what was before, was about 149,000 square feet of one and two story buildings, did some of the best science and research in the history of Stanford, but they were masonry block buildings. No, they're there, um, except for a donut courtyard. Uh, when we did the SEQ, we went from 149 to 620. We quadrupled the square footage, but we ended up with this big quad with pockets and layers, um, just like we have um, in other locations at campus. So I think the open space, we have to be more intentional as we get more dense. We have to be more intentional about where open space is. Uh, at the biochem area, for example, right now, we have a vision to do a quad commons that old chem in the Bass Biology Building will, will face. Right now, there was just a lot of buildings with you know, narrow spaces between them. So our goal is to, is to be a little more intentional about when you do have open space, make sure it's going to be functional and really help you deal with the density. Thank you for all of these wise things you've shared. I don't have any architecture background, and this has been really helpful. Um, there are a number of us here today who have recently been moved to a basement level within a building. And so I wonder if you have any suggestions for how one makes a space that, that doesn't have you know, light as an element um, built in with it, I guess. Which, or, build, which building are you in? We're all in Cubberley. Um, in yes. The, so, and we're, you know, we transitioned from other buildings where many of us had windows and things. So, you know, there's just a transition that we're all going through. And so, wondering if there are a couple of little suggestions you might make of some color we might put on a bookshelf or a picture placement or I don't know, you know, a light we might bring in or something to help to have some of these beautiful elements that you've described. Yeah, I, I think my number one thing would be looking at the lighting because so often we try to light basements, main levels, upper levels exactly the same way, whether they have windows or not. And I think to look at how lighting, and Rita's looking at me, she's our lighting consultant. Ah, I'm in trouble. <laughs> how lighting can really um, help you accentuate. And you know, if you painted one wall a really great accent color and had accent light on that wall, the focus would be less on how low the ceiling might be or the windows you can't look out of, but you're creating a focal point. John talked earlier about looking out these windows and the depth and the beauty of something beyond. And I think that's what you gotta, you gotta find sort of how to do that in a different way since you don't have the windows. And for, and for me, lighting in interior spaces below grade usually is why they feel so bad. So I actually have two questions, but I'll, I'll ask the easy, easier one first, perhaps. Um, one is, um, having spent some time many years ago as the director of Manzanita Park, when Manzanita Park was trailers, and observing you know, Stanford putting up buildings in a hurry when it needs them, um, I am curious about your thoughts about the new Escondido Village high rises and how those fit into the Stanford landscape and how people may respond to living in those spaces and what thought has been able to go into those questions, particularly knowing what architects know about communities and high rise buildings, given that there was an intense pressure to get them up very quickly and online. Um, so both from the aesthetics of them being part of the campus externally and from the behavior of, anticipated behavior of people living within them. 
The second question is a little bit more about the elite and privileged nature of Stanford's roots, development, and leadership, and how and whether architects and interior designers consider how spaces may be differentially interpreted and feel to a more diverse, culturally, socioeconomically, uh, et cetera, um, gendered um, group of individuals in an era when we are really trying to make the university more inclusive and more equitable. Okay. <laughs> why, don't, why don't I jump on the second question? I was going to jump on the second one, but go ahead. <laughs> Um, I think architects are doing a better job of thinking about how people experience their buildings from a cultural identity point of view. Um, there's a long way to go. And with that said, I think we're all human beings. And this, some of the things that I just talked about are, they cross cultures, they cross genders. They may be in a different balance they may be in a different uh, hierarchy. Um, so I think there's good news and bad news there that, that we're working on it and we have a ways to go. Um, and I think there's, we're gonna learn a lot in the next few years because I think, at least in the United States, I think we're, we're in, in the process of huge cultural shifts and that we don't fully recognize right now. And so I think that will have a play, have a role to play in architecture. Dave and I were talking before the, just before the talk about how privileged we feel to be able to work on a campus with the resources that we have. And I think you can look at that and say, we're, we're privileged and we should be worried about that. But I think we're, the university does an incredible job of maintaining and spending its resources wisely and maintaining the resources that we have. The, from the landscaping to the building maintenance. I've taught at San Jose State, I've taught at Berkeley, we're getting bathrooms cleaned or door hardware replaced is a near impossibility. Here, buildings are refreshed on a regular base, basis. We're very fortunate, but it's also a mark of stewardship and responsibility that we're able to do that and that we choose to do that. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna start with the second question. Um, and I think that, you know, we've been, we've been you know, battering around doing new residential halls for undergraduates over the last three or four years. And what makes me happy about the way our discussions are poised, it's not how fancy can we make these buildings, it's how do we enhance community. And, you know, if you took an inventory of the different undergraduate residential communities on campus right now, I think you'd find that some of the best ones are in some of the worst physical environments, but because they've had good leadership, they've actually been strong communities. And I think the fanciest storm on campus may not have the best community. And so we are really trying to, as we design those new buildings, understand what is going to enhance community and the communities are becoming more diverse. And, and how do you start to, in the residential areas, respond to that, but also understand how diversity comes together at the campus center is gonna be a huge part of the long range plan uh, of the president and the provost. So I, I think we're tackling it the right way and, and you, you've sort of sparked in my mind something, we haven't done a lot of discussion on how would a wide range of diverse students feel in that particular room. Um, and I think we could ask that question a lot more often. The um, how did Escondido Village happen is a really great question and some people are reacting to it because of the sheer height of it. Some people are reacting because of the sheer size of it. Some people are reacting because of the sheer, um, you know, the, the actual style of the building. The way the style came about, honestly, um, a couple of the options we looked at before we ended up where we were dealt really, they were almost like south of market San Francisco looking, and we said that's not sustainable, it's not durable, it's not something that would last that long at Stanford. And so with the help of, of many, and the leadership and board uh, included, we 
looked more towards the referencing of the Bakewell and Brown buildings that everybody still tends to love, the Encina Commons, Toyon Hall, Branner Hall, Robley Gym, uh, and, and, and looked at what are those qualities. And that's why when the rest of the project's done and you see arcades with wood ceilings and you see courtyards that are developed and you see um, smaller scaled buildings that will be really s helping to mitigate the size and the scale, um, I think it will anchor the end of what is now Jane Stanford Mall in a much different way than in Escondido Village did before, which was really surrounded by parking lots. And you kind of came back home to a dark area and kind of found your way to where you live. I think we're now gonna have a beacon at the end of Jane Stanford Way that will really bring graduate students back into the fold of the university. And when they go home at night, at, and some will go home at 12 and two o'clock in the morning from their research, they're going to really say, wow, I'm home, I see the beacon, there's gonna be a little tower with lights on it, and maybe I can stop in the cafe if it's open late and, and see some buddies. That's creating community, um, and we opted for the community and common spaces more than we did for the scale. Housing is at a crisis on the, you know, on the peninsula. It's no big um, revelation, and we did want to move quickly. Um, we were finding there were real, you know, tears in the fabric of being able to have graduate students that we wanted to recruit that could not come. They can't afford to live here. So it was meant to be somewhat urgent. Um, it has gone up quickly. Part of it's the construction technique, but it's sort, of, it's sort of eerie to see them just going up with windows in and not all cocked and the floors are in. And, um, but I think at the end of the day, it is higher density. We're going to be doing more higher density on campus. It's even more important that the question about the open spaces is taken very, very, very seriously in the connections. Thank you both for your wise and kind stewardship of the built environment of our community. Let's thank them with a round of applause.